they, they are about um, some different way of living or an alternative way of perceiving the world, but they don't necessarily often have those exact, uh, what used to be the defining features of punk when you thought of punk. Right, yeah. I mean, I just see them as themes of what people are writing now. And I realized earlier that I didn't actually describe my own. Well, I, I, I think I actually do have an untitled punk. My, my stories was um, unlikely characters usually disabled, just doing things anyway. So if you were going on adventures and solving problems, despite society never expecting them to. So if you guys come up with a cool <laughs> um, name for that, that'd be <laughs> really good. We're just going to be christening punks right and left tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> might, might as well. I think I found a list of like 20 of them. So <laughs> There's quite a few. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I will say that I'm, I'm actually kind of over the suffix punk. Um, it's mm -hmm. kind of lost its meaning, I think. I mean, and it, what you're saying, AT, I totally, totally agree. And I, and I think because of that, it's just completely, it's like Watergate, right? Every scandal is a gate now, even though mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense, right? Piece of gate. Yeah, oh my yeah, goodness. Piece of gate. Yeah. <laughs> Pieces of punk, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think initially that the term came into it, its full flowering when we started talking about cyberpunk. So that's, you know, a number of decades ago. And then it evolved into a marketing category and then other things kind of got, and you have post cyberpunk and you have, you know, all the variations on that, you know, and at the same time, I mean, cyberpunk is a deeply eighties kind of a genre. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, it's, it's, it's reflective of the world at the time. It's reflective of only a small number of populations. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot of it's based in how, you know, writers in the 80s understood technology was going to evolve. So it's, it's a certain vision of VR. It's a certain vision of surveillance. It's a certain vision of what, what corporations are going to be like. And some of it was prescient and some of it is, you know, kind of not. <laughs> right. So I guess you know, my, my question is because, you know, cyberpunk has evolved and changed and the punks have evolved and changed. Um, is there, if you agree with the, the, the punk category at all, are there new things that you've been running across that you're intrigued by, you're interested in, by, you maybe want to write in or are writing in? Uh, if you don't agree with the punk category, is there something that you think is a good substitute for it. Silk punk. Silk punk is really cool. Silk okay. punk is really, really, really cool, particularly um, in Ken Liu's uh, Dandelion Dynasty trilogy. I think it's funny too, because, you know, I think of that story and I don't even necessarily think anti-establishment, you know, ism, but I, I, I do, it, it does bring me to the relationship of humans or humanoids uh, with technology. And it really forces me to expand my definition of technology. You know, technology isn't, you know, it doesn't just have to be, you know, Atari consoles and like bio, you know, chips and stuff like that. Like it can be a printing press. Like printing press can be a technology that's utilized in a very sort of punk manner. I'm thinking also of, of, um, Ring Shout, the upcoming novella by P. Jelly Clark, which, you know, it's set in 1920s Georgia, but like there's a very sort of the, the ways in which the technologies of the time are utilized seems very, it seems fitting. And I don't even know if there's like a mechanical definition of it, but, you know, emotionally, it feels like a very punk story. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's interesting because I do think that punk is more, uh, and I think this speaks more to labels generally. For me, it's a lot more of a sort of sensation and a feeling that is evoked than a particular, you know, series of tropes, so to speak. And so, I, and it's funny because I think that's, that's a feeling that I get from a lot of writers of color. Like they're writing from a perspective that is sort of inherently just by virtue of their life experience, anti-establishment, right? And there's something very punk about that whole thing, like very much like 
taking on the machine type, uh, you know, and, and I find that all very invigorating. I do think it's something that resists categorization, right? Because you don't necessarily want it to be the case that like, oh, all East Asian authors write silk punk, right? Or all, you know, African authors or authors of African descent, right? I don't know, like sand punk or something like that, right? I, I think there's a sort of, you know, if we can, if we can sort of give credence to the feeling that's evoked without necessarily feeling, you know, compelled to figure out what shelf in the bookstore that that particular story belongs on, I think that's a way of 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 still managing to do the story justice while at the same time, um, you know, letting it spread its wings, so to speak. But yeah, silk punk to answer your question. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I agree with Toshi that, like, I think we use these terms to kind of describe what we don't have words for, because <laughs> cause it's, it's, it's like um, the, that uh, wine chart when people are trying to describe what they're tasting, and we, we just don't really have a vocabulary for it. Um, so I, don't, I actually don't mind the term punk at all. Um, but I, what to jump off of what Toshi said. Um, I, I think th I've seen a lot of retelling and reclamation re stories. Um, basically, basically like people like Paige Jelly Clark um, taking histories and rewriting them unashamedly. And we're just taking stories that we know so well and giving them, you know, a feminist spin or, um, you know, a, a different POV that uh, we don't normally see. And uh, I, I don't know if there's a word for that, but it's very exciting and I love it. Would it, would it be fair to say that all of these punk genres have some element of, of humanism that they're, they're based on? Or, or, you know, just I, like you don't hear about greed punk or oligarchy punk. <laughs> you know, uh, it's really hard to make that punk, I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oppression chic. <laughs> <laughs> well, it exists, we just don't call it that. Exa exactly, exactly. No, we call that Brooks Brothers. Um, so, I, well, I think, I think that's a very interesting question because I do think that a lot of these other perspectives, you know, oftentimes operate in traditions that shift the dynamic of individual versus community. I think the, you know, the sort of Western conception of punk is like, oh, it's like, you know, the individual versus the man or the machine or what have you. And, you know, there's, a, you know, it's, it's about the outsider or the rebel and they're singular, right? Whereas I feel in a lot of these other stories there, you know, they can be stories of family or stories of community or stories of found family. Um, and that's, you know, and that's sort of the, the primary node in terms of sort of narrative movement. And so I think I think there is still a humanism. It's just, it may not necessarily be, you know, the, the, it may not necessarily be a story predicated on trumpeting the value of the individual as opposed to, you know, the value of community or the value of, of I don't know, the, the, the greater, you know, because I think a lot about the changing relationships between people and the environment, right? Like, I wonder what something like solar punk would look like in, you know, coming from an indigenous tradition where, you know, historically they had a very different relation, you know, tribes had a very different relationship with the environment than like Western industrialists, you know? And so I think that's, you know, I think it, that's something that, that bears keeping in mind when thinking about you know issues of, of sort of humanism and rebellion within the context of, of punk traditions. You know as you're saying this and, and then I'll get back to you Alan, um, I'm thinking actually of some of Le Guin's work like the word for world is forest and I'm not offering her up as a substitute for indigenous voices but just on an earlier take that doesn't really get acknowledged as you know encompassing a little bit of that you know in in terms of you know creating a civilization alien civilization that is 
you know, built around their own natural world and that's where their technology comes from. And, you know, I, and I think we, we don't really talk about some of that early work in the context of things. We have this, you know, waves, you have cyberpunk and then you have this other thing and then you have this. And we kind of ignore that, you know, there were precursors to this, that there were writers who were kind of playing with these ideas early on. You know, that maybe, you know, that those works should get re-examined in the context of some of the ways that we write about those things now. Yeah, because you think about like controlled burns, like that's a, that's a hack. Like that's right. technology right there, you know? And that like, imagine the, the fiction that can grow out of, or that has grown out of a sort of cultural fabric of which that is a part, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I think that would be fascinating. So Alan, would you like to add anything? Um, I, you know, I think Toshi really hit on something when he talked about community. Um, as somebody who would describe himself as a punk, even in my 40s, um, uh, you know, community was always something that was important to the music scene uh, when I used to do stuff like that, you know what I mean? And I think it's, it's um, a major factor for solar punk and hope punk too. I mean, I think it's something they're trying to push and I think they're trying to, uh, in a way, do away with this uh, singular chosen hero kind of figure, you know what I mean? Um, so... I don't know where exactly I want to go with that other than to say like I'm, I'm looking forward to getting rid of the chosen uh, the chosen hero trope. <laughs> In everything, yes. <laughs> yeah, when, when I was researching for the panel I ran across something called Formica Punk which was a new one on me and this is apparently set in the 80s with 80s technology except not virtual reality it's things like VHS tapes and Formica. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that referred to as cassette punk too, I think. Yeah, yeah, I saw that too. Uh, yeah. one, of the, one of the things, um, another punk that, that we haven't mentioned, I don't even know how real a punk it is, but uh, if, you, if you ever saw the movie Nine, where the little, little stitch dolls are in that movie, I've heard that referred to as, as stitch punk. And, and why that came to mind was just the idea of community and not the, necessarily the chosen one kind of thing. But you know the little community that's in the apocalyptic world that, that tries to to get together and, and and do things, but not in a Walking Dead sort of way. <laughs> um, you know, Ooh, so, that's very community driven in its own way. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yes. It, is. Um, it it explores the darker side of community, I would say. <laughs> um, you know, rather than than the cooperative side. But when 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 we're looking at stories, that's one of the things that we try to get when we put out a call for stories is we talk about the idea of, let me see a community solving a problem, um, rather than a hero who steps in and saves everything, um, shut, or a group of people. And uh, while it what wasn't necessarily punk, just along the, maybe it was punk, but we have a, a story about, uh, that takes place on Mars, but the idea is that um, there's a first civilization on Mars, or a first city on Mars kind of thing, settlement, and the teenagers, you know, they've, they've kind of grown up there and they think they feel it's like their planet. But the, the adults are basically saying, but this is having deleterious effects on your biology. We're shipping you all back to Earth. And they get together as a group of kids and try to figure out how to rebel against that. Um, it's like, you know, we're here. This is our home. This is where we want to grow up. This is where we want to contribute. And even in being forced to leave, they're trying to figure out how to at least make a statement, even, even if they're forced to go back home, how do they make a statement that, no, we are in charge of our own destinies? So, you know, I, I tend to try to look for those, those community-driven or group-driven things as well. I think one of the, the interesting things has been watching this kind of evolve. Um, I, I read steampunk, I hang out at steampunk conventions and so forth. So I, I've, I've been watching it gradually, you know, transform into something where there's a greater emphasis on it, not having Western settings, for example, not being set in Victorian London, having things outside of that, um, including queer characters, including disabled characters, you know, all the different voices that can be integrated into that. And speaking of, of P. Jelly Clark, um, a dead Jin in Cairo is just, it's a brilliant version of that because 
it can see steampunk from where it's standing, but it's going in a very different direction with mm. gin and different technology and different characters. And it's set in, you know, a 1920s-esque Cairo. And there's all kinds of things in it that a steampunk audience can still look at it and go, yes, this is part of what we, we read and what we get into, but it's still breaking new ground and going in a new direction. And I think that, that that's something really brilliant and it's really nice to see that. And, uh, okay, I'm gonna probably do one more round of, of questions for the panels at, panelists and then I will get to the questions in Q&A because we've got a couple so far. Okay, um, did anyone wanna add anything more to what we've been talking about? Well, actually, one one question I had, and and this is something that I think about um, a lot, and would be and would be very interested, at to like get your take on this, the sort of individual community paradigm in the context of of disability, because I know, like you know, with regards to, or at least from what I've what I've seen and what I you know what I've experienced with regards to disability and whatnot, there there can be this this focus on the the individual whether the individual is 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 disabled and whatnot and sort of there and trying to reframe the story from oh like disability isn't something to be you know triumphed over it is like part of the core like it's it's you like it's part of right. it's part of you and so i was just wondering like in the stories that you've that you've written and that you've encountered like what your thoughts on 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 that were uh so just disability and community and how to yeah just like i like that was a very poorly formed question <laughs> i'm just making sure i understood the question and also you were asking about um how to not shift the focus away from just the disability so so with regards to you know um disabled characters and their place in story with regards to like primacy of the individual mm. versus like placement in a community? So, uh, so there's a very specific thing that I, I try to do in my story and it's based off of my own experience. Um, first of all, I should, I should note that most disabled people find communities of some sort. I didn't find one I'm still kind of finding mine. I have disabled friends now and, you know, it's, it's much better than it was when I was a teenager or in my 20s where I felt like the only one. Uh, so it's, so in my stories, I, I, I try to, my character will have a disability, but it, it, it would just be just the kind of the way I see myself like yeah I, I have a walking disability but I go through my life and I don't really think about it until there's like a really steep curve or something I have to figure out how to get around that um so I treat my I don't lower the expectations of my character and, stuff. Mm. and um something I've I personally been working on is also having multiple people with disabilities and um a story and having it, having them sometimes have conversations about it because even though like one person will have a disability, it would be even if it's the same same one, be totally different for someone else. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's all about. I, I for me, I, I always argue that the the character has to seem real to people. It has to be a genuine human being. And everything else comes from that. You can get away with so much. Um, like you can, you can make them have conversations if they feel like real people. That kind of answer your question? Yeah, no, definitely. definitely. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah. Okay, um, I have a, we have a question for Scott about what the name of the story about the teenagers on Mars was. Yeah, I, I saw that, and so I had to look it up. It's by Emily Ma, and it's called Wrath of the Lightweight. It's in um, issue two of Dreamforge. I'll show you the illustration. I want to watch it, because that's pretty punk. See if you can get the glare off of it. <laughs> um, so so oh, we've, got, okay. we've got basically a pressure suit that's, that's pretty punk there. <laughs> so, nice. so that's pretty cool. Okay, cool. All right. Okay. All right. Um, hmm. 
not entirely sure that this is a question we can tackle on this panel. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll kind of move forward. And if you think of another like smaller scale question to ask about this, um, Patricia, you know, feel free to, to type it into the chat. Um, so yeah, I think that it's interesting because um, I, I ID as bisexual or queer, and we have a lot of conversations about how you get away from you know, s stereotyping and red shirting your characters and so forth. And a lot of it is showing your characters in some way to be part of a community so that there is, there is someone who is somewhat like them who they are interacting with and they are not the only one of their kind in the entire universe. And I think that that kind of spills over into a lot of different categories of, you know, people who are, you know, within the US, which is the, the dominant voice in science fiction and fantasy publishing at the moment still, you know, that you're not focusing on somebody who is there as a token, who is there as a victim, um, but you're incorporating them into the fabric of the story so that they are part of their world, but that also means in general that there are other people like them, just to one degree or another. And I think that, you know, that, that touches on some really important points about inclusion and diversity and how we handle things like that, you know, as writers, as publishers, as editors. Um, so what would you say, recommend that people should definitely read? They're interested in your favorite punk. Um, you can recommend your own work if you want to, you can recommend other people's, um, but what would you say? I mean, and, and it doesn't have to be written. You can pick another medium if you want to. I've got a whole list whenever you're ready. Okay. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. Well, uh, for Hope Punk, um, there's this magazine called Dream Forge that you should probably check out. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. <laughs> uh, but uh, there are some authors that are considered uh, uh, like the, I don't know, the standard Hope Punk. Uh, Becky Chambers is one, Alexandra Rowland. Um, I would say those are probably the main two. But um, a lot of stuff I've been reading lately would include uh, A Tale of Truths by Barrett Ellingson, um, TJ Berry's Space Unicorn Blues, uh, Jamie Lackey's The Forest God. I would include all of that into Hope Punk. Um, for Solar Punk, you should check out World Weaver Press, which is run by Serena Ulibarri. Pretty much everything they do is Solar Punk. Yeah, and Alan just stole mine because I was going to recommend Serena and World <laughs> Press also, and and some good books like Solar Punk Winters, um, you know mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, definitely check that out. And actually, I'll I'll put a link in the uh, notes over here. I, I know Cat um, Cat Rambo did a whole post on this, um, and she has a gigantic list. Yeah, that would also be a good thing to include in the Discord afterwards if you got a few minutes. Because more people are seeing the Discord, and whereas the chat will just go away when we're done. Sure. So, yeah. yeah, I'd say for for Silk Punk, you know, you can't go wrong with JY Yang and their Tensort series, um, and Ken Liu's work, uh, particularly with the Dandelion Dynasty. But I think one of the one of the reasons I recommend him is that particularly through his translation work he can open the door to a lot of really interesting stuff that's being done in the realm of Chinese science fiction um, there are a lot of authors that can be that can be sort of discovered there and you can see sort of how they fit within various punk traditions um, and you know, I mean I would be remiss if I didn't recommend Riot Baby. <laughs> Take every opportunity to to you know to to show my book as possible. Um because I do think I do think there's something very punk about it. Um and I think it's very interesting commentary on issues of diversity and inclusion and stereotyping and whatnot. You know, there you know, you'll have stories where, you know all the black characters are like victims of, of white supremacy. And like, you know, even as a black author, I, I, you know, I'll be like, oh man, I don't want to read or write about, you know, black characters being victims of white supremacy, but I wrote a whole book about black characters being victims of white supremacy. But I think one of the, one of the interesting things about it and AT, I think this goes to your point when you were talking about um, having characters, even if they're characters who, who have the same disability in conversation with each other, is that there are moments that sort of 
thicken the depiction of these characters as human beings so that they don't just exist along the vector of suffering. You know, there's that one corner outside the bodega where all the guys are cracking jokes like that, like that. And they're hilarious and they're brilliant. And they're sort of like the philosopher kings of Harlem, right? And, you know, you'll have these other moments that are sort of like, like, you know, like, stars in the night or little islands of of hope or levity or just you know non-violence or like you know the whatever the opposite of violence is um and i think that goes a long way towards because these are stories that need to be told right like these are stories that need to get out there these are things that people need to read um but this is a way of sort of of combating the stereotype where it's it's not just the one dimension of suffering there's a whole other side to it um yeah so read riot baby <laughs> i'm a huge fan of less fiction about suffering what do you got at uh so i actually posted one in the chat um when i think of solo punk i think of that one uh it's by ac wise it's called a catalog of sunlight at the end of the world um Nice. And uh, it's, it's always the one I kind of think of. Um, also, uh, what was it called? There's one about Elizabeth Bayer a year ago, and I'm blanking out. Um, that was uh, not really, I guess, not really soul punk, but it had a lot of environmental issues. Um, I'm blanking out right now. Um, but in terms of, um, I guess, steampunk, I just read Dread Nation uh, a couple months ago, and that is one of my favorite. I don't know if it quite counts as steampunk, but in my head it does. Um, but I like that one. Um, and I guess Monstrous is also mm -hmm. a, comic, a uh, graphic novel which I just read recently, which is so good. Um, go check that one out. And I, I guess I'll plug my own work for Hope Punk, um, Give to Family My Love, which just won a Nebula um, this year. I think people found very hopeful. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it talks about environmental collapse and how to find hope in dark times, so. Something you just said, um, Tochi, made me think of Daniel Jose Older's work. Mm -hmm. And just in terms of, of writing about communities, but writing about people who are outsiders to you know, white mainstream communities and how, how their, their, their lives overlap, but it's not about, you know, it, it's about the things that they're dealing with and the various you know, issues that they need to resolve. It's not about suffering for the sake of, of, of purative suffering, <laughs> um, you know, which I, I think is something that, you know, certainly we get a lot of, you know, we, we've had a lot of with queer characters, we get a lot of with characters of color, you know, that, that there's this whole, you know, subgenres of that. Um, I think for me, uh, the steampunk that I would recommend, um, definitely P. Jelly Clark's work. I don't know if he would necessarily call it steampunk, but it certainly has, you know, enough overlap that I think people who were looking for that would be, would be very open to it. It's so good. Um, who cares? Go read it anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Categorizations be damned. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, Elizabeth Bear's Karen memory is a lot of fun. That's a good one. I like that one, that one a lot. Um, I'm going to recommend Alex Axe. Um, so Murder on the Titania and Other Steam-Powered Adventures is the first book and Wireless and More Steam-Powered Adventures is the second book. And Alex also, uh, writing as Alex Wells for Angry Robot, has a series about coal miners in space. So it's got kind of a diesel punk thing going on. Um, and that's Hunger Makes the Wolf and Blood Binds the Pack. And there, you know, there's there's space biker witches and all kinds of fun stuff but it's basically you know coal mining strikes taken from colorado and put in outer space <laughs> um, in a way that i think that a lot of steampunk doesn't really talk about class issues so i think it's 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 really worthwhile to be looking at the different approaches that you know authors are taking with newer work and uh 
Oh, and Cat Rambo's new series with Tor. That will be another one to look forward to. All right, so we are gradually getting to the end of our time. Um, does anybody have things they want to add? Things they're hoping to see in the future? Questions from the audience? Um, I just, just had a note as an, an additional resource to, to check into for people who are interested in solar punk specifically. Um, earlier in the year, we were on uh, Imaginary Worlds podcast. So if you don't know that one, it's a very good podcast, almost as good as Alan's. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I uh, didn't be compared to them as <laughs> Imaginary Worlds um, is excellent. Episode, episode 141 is about solar punk. And, and they interviewed us and Serena Ulibarri and, and went into the values of solar punk and that sort of thing. So that's an additional resource. Look up Imaginary Worlds episode 141. Oh, um, Juju Punk. I can't believe I went a whole panel about punk without mentioning <laughs> this entire subgenre <laughs> coming, coming out of the African continent, <laughs> the entire African continent of uh, Juju Punk. I mean, uh, just very briefly, you know, to circle back to, you know, this issue of technology or technologies, you know, this idea of you know, it's sort of like, you know, you have magic infused technologies, like you could have, you know, a TV screen, for instance, that has a spirit trapped inside, like it's very interesting ways in which African and particularly African religious ontologies are braided into, you know, sort of technological advances. So I think, you know, the, I think, you know, I don't know if, if she would call it this, but one of the things that immediately jumps to mind when I think Juju Punk is the Binti series um, by mm -hmm. Nnedi Okorafor. And there's a whole wealth of African science fiction, particularly short fiction, Wally Talabi. Um, um, and then of course there's Tare Thompson's uh, Rosewater trilogy um, that are very, that very interestingly delve into the, the, I don't even want to, want to call it the relationship between, you know, um, you know, spiritualism and technology, because that implies often that there are two separate things when in many places they are one and the same. And so I would, you know, I would just recommend if there are particular authors that you want to, that you want to sort of check out or more that you want to find out about it, just, you know, Google Juju Punk and, and, and have, have at it. I actually I really recommend Rosewater. I just didn't know what punk to put in. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I know what. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I came to the rescue. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I would also highly suggest that series. I, I finished the first two. I haven't read the third one yet, but man, the, the first two are just awesome. Yeah. So awesome. Ooh. Yeah, I had not run across that term before. I like that. <laughs> AT, did you want to say something? Um, Your box lit up briefly, so I wasn't sure if you gestured or you. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm. Just... Well, I will. I will say, if you're interested in the definition of hope punk, we did um, an interview with uh, Alexandra Rowland. It's actually our first episode. You can go and check that out. And um, I guess I'll put all this in Discord later. But uh, we also did in my old podcast, we did uh, an interview with Serena Ulibarri about solar punk too, where we talked about what solar punk is and, and that sort of thing. So, um, check that stuff out. Okay. And I just wanted to say everybody take their punk and go make a better world with it. Like, you know, go, go love people and do kind things and, and, you know, change the world. So don't it's just do it. Patience. Hopeful punk. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has been great. I've learned a lot. <laughs> Likewise. No, I'm really glad we had this, this discussion. Um, so hopefully you can, a couple of people can make it over to Discord at least for a couple of minutes and we'll give people links and things they can go check out after this. And yeah, and I think we're, we're down to like, aw. Um, somebody just wrote best panel oh, so far. Thank you. Oh, thank <laughs> <you>. <laughs> That's always amazing. I don't know how that happened. This must be your first panel. <laughs> I, I will have you know that I walked into this, found out I was moderating like an hour or so ago, and went, oh, well, time to throw something together. Yeah, <laughs> well, you did yeah, a heck of a job. You knocked it, yeah. knocked it out the park. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you a good question. You're an excellent panelist to work with. So, so thank you very much.
Now we stare awkwardly at each oh, other for the last minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm just going to apologize for not being able to make it to Discord. I have an awesome interview right after this. Ah, okay. oh, yeah. I am not ignoring all of you. I just... <laughs> I'll, I'll be between uh, AT's interview and Discord, so I'll be floating around somewhere. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Excellent. Yeah, so, so if you think of anything we should include, let me know and I'll, I'll add it to Discord as one of your recommendations. So. Okay. Yay, <laughs> somebody has just discovered Hope Punk. <laughs> uh, Discord is whatever room we are in right now. I think we are in Opal Night. Opal Night. Thank you. Thank you. I'm like running through a mental list of Martha's <laughs> settings and so forth and going, uh, murder bot room? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, so there, there is a link in the chat if people want to go onto Discord, so. All right, guys, it's been great. Um, very good seeing everybody. Um, AT and Tochi, I got to read some of your stuff and you too, Catherine. So um, thanks I really so appreciate it. it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks to all of you. This was, this was an absolute pleasure. Highlight of my night. Excellent, good to know. Likewise. Thank you. Hope the interview goes well. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm going to cut out now. Yeah. <laughs>